Very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, while I'm the Chief Technology Officer in LNT Technology Services, would like to believe uh, I'm passionate about technology, but I believe uh, that the school of thought I belong to says, business and domain first, technology later. Technology solves problems, and you can't lead with technology. You have to lead with the type of businesses that you're trying to address, uh, the problems, the use cases that you are uh, trying to look at, which are very unique. So you couldn't have got a much better eminent uh, panel than the three gentlemen here. Uh, you've heard the introductions uh, uh, about them. But before I go to request them for their thought on supply chain, COVID made all of us aware of the importance of supply chain. Following COVID, the geopolitics about supply chain disruption across the globe is also raising very serious issues and have even become a topic of discussion in G20. And then when you looked at a Ukraine conflict, you also suddenly realize that the importance of Ukraine is that it produces neon, which is a rare metal required for mobile production. So with this type of complexity that you have in supply chain, time to request our eminent panelists their views on what's happening on supply chain now that we are two years post-COVID and listen to what are the challenges that they are uh, facing and what is the new architecture of supply chain that they envisage as India becomes a global player. So Zarwan, two years, what's happening to supply chain? Start by. I'm going to start by making a strong statement that uh, competition is not between companies, it's between supply chains. And uh, the pandemic, in a way, has uh, exposed the weakness in our supply chain. There were norms and things that we took for granted back then. And it actually forced us to take a relook as it exposed these weaknesses, and we had to rush into doing risk analysis in order to understand the robustness of our prevailing supply chain systems. And um, it's the evolution and digitization of the supply chain which really helped enterprises to run and navigate the disruption which the pandemic threw up at us, which allowed the various enterprises to respond to the volatile supply and demand. Now, I've choose this, chosen this word volatile with a degree of care because I think one of the things that has come out as a result of this is that uh, customer tolerance for waiting time has come down substantially. I mean, it has over the years. Some of us gray-haired people know that, knew that we used to wait 13 years after booking a Bajaj scooter, but you know, we, we've come far away from there. But, so, but the point is today, not able to supply demand is a loss of a business opportunity, very clearly. It's not that it's going to delay it, but there's going to be a loss of opportunity. Some of the positives that have come out of this is that supply chain has finally got a voice and a much needed incentive and investment in order for us to develop its agility and make it leaner. And uh, high-performing supply chains are now perceived as a business necessity and a tool in business competitiveness. So what really are the changes? It's visibility, efficiency and cost optimization, and resilience. I could talk at length about these, but I will only leave it to say at this, that visibility became the number one of all of this across the because we, as, a, as an enterprise, when we had to deal with a multitude of suppliers, it became important for us to have visibility to track where the material is, readiness of the material, availability, and in certain cases, where conditions of the supply of the uh, logistics also had to be maintained. All these, the visibility was, is what played a major role, which again then helps quality and improves on the predictability. So I'm going to leave it there because there's a lot more that we can talk about, but uh, these are just some initial thoughts on what the pandemic has done for us. Thank you. Uh, Shubhanka, just building up on what Zarwan said, you yeah. know, uh, yeah, just one point. How important 
is supply chain architecture in today's uh, decision making when Indian enterprises are trying to become global in their aspirations? Yeah, thanks Ashish and Zuron very rightly said. So the question is, post COVID, has the situation for supply chain become normal? It is not. And why it is not? There are multiple factors which we need to still understand. The market is still very volatile. If you look at the economies, US is into a mild recession or towards a recession. China is in a very similar situation. India is a shining spot. So overall, there is uncertainty in the market. The customer behaviors and patterns have also changed. On top of it, we have a disruption in the automobile sector where we will migrate to EVs and hydrogen ice engines and fuel cells. And on top of it, the availability of electronic parts still remains a big challenge. So what does it, what does it ultimately culminate into? It culminates into what Zurwan rightly said, Supply chain dynamics have changed, and what is the next gen supply chain needs to have are definitely three, three things which we have all heard multiple times now. It needs to be agile, it needs to be resilient, it needs to be de risked. Now, the question is how do you derive or achieve all these okay, for a supply chain? What we study and what we have realized is to bring agility, what Zurwan rightly said, you need end-to-end -end visibility, okay? You need end-to-end -end visibility, but not just the visibility, the capability to respond in a short span of time because of the variation in demand and variation on the, over the customer expectation, which implies our traditional ways of managing demand through statistical forecasting is little short of requirement and hence comes the next platform which is the demand sensing that's on the agility front on because Ashish asked what are the platforms we need to look at to uh, to meet the current requirement and then we come to resilience and there we have what we had five years or ten years back we have much capable platforms today where we can do a better planning and these are called integrated business planning platforms Okay, they are digital integrated business planning platforms where you can run scenario planning. You can do a scenario planning because that's what is needed for resilience. Resilience is the capability to come back. And for that, you need scenario planning. These scenario planning capabilities based on the auth our traditional ERP systems were difficult. But today, those, these platforms, pretty capable platforms are available across the market that can help you to do the scenario planning. And third, and not the least, is how do you de-risk the supply chain, which is your supply chain ERM. And there we have tools and there are many changes in dimensions like the topics we have, what we used to think today, we used the most efficient ways to run with the Kanban. Today we are looking at maintaining strategic inventories. What used to be economies of scale, producing at a distant country, bringing it to India, actually get those economies of scale. We are now looking at near shoring or French shoring, which means produce it at a, place which is very closer to the market because you don't know what disruptions in can come if the supply chain tail is so long. So these so dimensions are changing. Agile, resilient, and dearest are the new dimensions. But today, we are fortunate that there are platforms available which can help you reach there. Uh, thanks, Shubankar. Harish, uh, Asian Paints. So question is, uh, festive season coming before we ask you a question uh, do we get 25 or 30 percent discount <laughs> look at the show of hands <laughs> nobody's allowing you to go back uh, uh, your views given that you are in an industry where the quality of your end product can be seen immediately the moment you leave behind your imprints uh, what are the challenges in supply chain that you are seeing in the new world order where the customer expectations are increasing, where the supply chain is very intricate and the product shelf life is very small is what I would assume, right? So uh, thanks for the opportunity in this forum. I think a uh, very interesting blend of a tech and a you know business kind of coming together. So uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, yeah, festive season is coming and uh, uh, I think uh, really, uh, yeah, so <laughs> uh, 
but i think there is one more element to our product and that is you know how uh, you know uh, our involvement in in the product category called paint over the current time has kind of gone up but usually it is always been led through a contractor and a painter right so you would only choose a color but essentially it's the person who kind of does the work who kind of you know uh, takes it up right so uh, for us i think managing this whole ecosystem and really you know ensuring the product availability across the country has always been the core uh, business driver and uh, if you really see about asian pays business model way back when the company got founded was to really bypass the uh, the distributor right so always uh, there was and fortunately for us because of that we had to really rely a lot on technology and data because serving a very diverse country like uh, india and really going to tier 3 towns required that we had good visibility systems across so uh, those investments always kind of you know uh, were there and uh, that really helped us to uh, really be prepared for you know what shubhankar mentioned in terms of you know being agile resilient uh, throughout let's say the pandemic kind of a period uh, yeah customer choices are shifting and you know the product life as well as uh, you know the choices are really becoming shorter so uh, really having your you know conceptualizing a product is not enough but really you have to make it available and uh, for our industry where uh, uh, there is lot of dependency let's say even on an imported component so really uh, looking at maybe level 2 or level 3 implications of this global disruption uh, kind of you know becomes that much more uh, you know important so for example you mentioned about the neon in ukraine what we realized is that ukraine actually is uh, has ports where lot of those uh, merchant navy crews do transition now when ukraine went through a war then you know that whole thing got disrupted so even if we don't import anything from ukraine all our supplies kind of got impacted because of that particular factor now how do you really think of not only immediate let's say your tier 2 supplies but maybe third or fourth factor implication is what kind of you know uh, becomes a differentiator in terms of how companies can respond to the changing customer needs right so i think overall uh, as we kind of really look at uh you know in, in the current times supply chain and uh, the enablement of digital technology will become core to probably existence of companies right so that's the way i would like kind of look at it so harish uh, just since we are on that topic how many vendors do you have and uh, these vendors are from how many countries in your supply chain ecosystem A any idea yeah so uh, uh, approximate guess so i think the count uh, is probably you know around 800 vendors but the difference is that we deal with a whole range of vendors right we deal with large petrochemical companies and large specialty chemical companies on one side on the other side we also deal with very niche local manufacturers who kind of you know uh, let's say you know create some pigments and so on and so forth so i think the range is very uh, very diverse and and hence you know they have very different capabilities in some cases maybe we are the uh, you know dominant uh, share of that vendor in other cases we might be very minuscule so dealing with that variation uh, across let's say uh, around uh, 8 900 specialty chemicals is where the complexity kind of comes in so now that we know to a great extent the type of complexity that you're talking of and agile resilient demand forecasting real time information available when you're looking and designing your supply chains for the growth projections uh, there is a process part what role does technology choices and the road map of what technology companies have to offer uh, plays in your overall vision of what the supply chain should look like so uh, really if you look at how asian paints approached uh, uh, and uh, approach the whole it architecture for supply chain it's been a fairly uh, long journey for us in fact the uh, whoever joins asian paints gets to hear the story that in 71 is when there were three um, mini uh, computers in mumbai one was with iit mumbai the other was with barc which is the baba atomic research center and asian paints hmm. has the third uh, mini frame right so i would say really hats off to the uh, the founder uh, family who kind of thought about investing in technology way back at that point of time and over the years that technology has kind of grown in terms of really bringing in uh, both aspects of visibility and analytics into into the game uh, although more and more uh, as what shubhankar mentioned the forecast 
stability is kind of going down and we have to really rely on real time uh, sensing from the from the point of sale uh, out there so uh, overall i think uh, coming to the architecture question i think the way we see digital architecture in nation pain is to use digital because in, in supply chain what are we doing we are always trying to perfect the reality you plan something and the next moment it becomes out, outdated because the events keep changing so the idea for us is to uh, you know use digital to perfect reality and constantly keep doing that uh, engine to keep on uh, you know having the next level of visibility to then feed into a decision making system so i think that's the architecture where you got a visibility engine which can you know plug in data from point of sale factories and vendors uh, feed into some kind of an analytical model and then the vision which we are getting into is something to kind of create a co-pilot uh, for our uh, frontline sales force because i think it's impossible at the size and scale to kind of you know leave the analytics to the person to kind of look at a dashboard you should just keep prompting him what is the next best best action they need to do i think we are not reached there but i think that's the next level of vision which we can think of getting into thanks sirish zarwan the same question to you you come from a different industry uh, what about you, the complexity of your supply chain ecosystem and how are you looking at new technologies to solve some of these problems yeah so uh, the challenges that we have in our uh, particular industry are definitely different uh, now you know when when i was being introduced you heard about the fact that we are talking about factory locations from uttarakhand right down to tamil nadu and as a product that we that we you know offer to the market it's not a box product but a solution and a solution which is going to require something coming in from the north something coming in from the south maybe something coming in from the west what we require is having a supply chain such that all these can be dovetailed and reach the customer at one time so to the customer it really doesn't matter which part of the country it's coming from as long as he gets the whole thing together the way he needs it when he needs it so for us the challenges of supply chain are to ensure that we are able to run this right across the country and ensure what we call ot for on time in full now the percentage of ot that we are able to maintain today as a result of the various systems that have been put into place are in the region of about 95% and that's not good enough we know that because to the 5% it's a it's a big big issue so we need to you know work on that and we will the point that i'm trying to make there is that whereas we might have a master plan that is made centrally each of our locations have to handle their own supply chains to ensure that we may give the material so the various lead times are taken into account the visibility of the suppliers material availability is taken into account now initially all these things we would try and de-risk by building buffer of inventories at various places and those small buffers can mean a lot cost cost blockage blockage of working capital using this technology now we are able to make it lean we are able to work with having stocks of what we require we know what is available at various places and therefore we do not have the additional overstocking that is taking place also we have approximately 1000 vendors across the country so and a lot of them will supply to multiple locations now the weakest link in this supply chain happens to be the vendors because we also have small scale vendors whose systems are not uh, what should i say geared up for us to be able to use technology to so a lot of the work that is being done is to bring them to a level where we can then apply the technology make their uh, work more visible okay yeah. and therefore that helps us so we are working through that development process in order to be able to help us to work the supply chain in a more robust manner wow so many opportunities for all the people wanting to sell to supply chain guys <laughs> shubhankar customer aspirations uh, of quality uh, cost pressures resiliency supply chain global uh, global networks uh, global aspirations growing economy 
all of these are impacting the supply chain decisions you're making, right? How are you factoring so much of variability as you plan for the future? Yeah, very apt question, Ashish. Uh, so let me bring a little bit of complexity that we run uh, globally and in India. So globally, Cummins is about a $26 billion organization. In India, we are about $3.5 billion. We run 16 manufacturing locations across India and produce engines, turbochargers, exhaust system, filters, and engines starting from as low as 60 horsepower to 3,000 horsepower. Wow. That's the range. And the, to ask the question that how do you cater to the next gen customer expectation where the customer is actually expecting 100% OTIF, okay, at a cost which really you can't afford, that's the expectation, and you know, that customer is always right. And quality levels, quality is a table stake actually. They, they don't expect that they touch the engine once it reaches them. So what we are doing is that we are trying to help of technology to support this, and it's, we are still not there, but we are trying to divide it into three parts. One is from the manufacturing side, how we are enabling our factories. What we are doing is we are connecting our factories uh, so that we try to transform them. So the first plant in India was set up 60 years back, so we are pretty orthodox kind of manufacturing, and the latest plant was set up about four years back, so we have very advanced state of manufacturing. So it's a mix of technology. What we are doing is that we are connecting all the equipments, depending on the level of advancement in that equipment, to take the data into cloud. And while we take it into the cloud, we are looking at two parameters. One is the overall equipment effectiveness, the OE, how do you improve? Because everybody does monitor OE maybe manually, and some, some of them are doing digitally. But when you transition from a manual monitoring to a digital monitor, you will see there's a drop in OE for at least 20 to 25 points, okay? Because you're, you're capturing all the data. So that's what we are doing. We are transitioning, connecting all the equipments into the cloud, and that's what we are called smart factories. Uh, one is OE, other is we are what we liquid is a condition-based monitoring, CBM. That today, sitting in Pune, I can monitor on my laptop an equipment operating in indoor and how is the motor warming up or it is getting overheated. I don't do it, but if I want, I can do it, okay? That's the capability we are building so that we know what is the uptime of the equipment, when it needs maintenance, and is it tending towards producing any defects. That's on the manufacturing side. On the quality side, we are uh, we, what we call quality 4.0. We, we have two things. One is that we are trying to capture all the quality data right at every stage of manufacturing. And I was discussing with uh, uh, Harish that uh, the manufacturing execution system we implemented way back, almost a decade back. It captures at every stage of manufacturing all the quality data, which includes how did you assemble, who assembled it, how long did it take, and the data goes into cloud. So even after 10 years, if an engine fails, we cannot tell you who produced it, when did they produce, and what parameters were monitored at that point of time. That's on the quality side, and we are also doing something because in Indian dynamics, you always have a mix of permanent workforce and reflex workforce. That's, I guess, taken for granted because of the uh, variation in demand and the, uh, in the market. What we do is that we, we are implementing a concept called skill spot, that any critical machine, a person goes and starts operation before that they have to sign up, and it tells you whether the person is trained, whether he's capable to, to do that operation. Else, he is registered, he can't run the operating machine. So that's on the quality side. And on the supply chain side, what we are doing is we are digitally connecting the entire planning process. So what we said is the digital IBP, which is the digital integrated business planning module, along with demand sensing, is something which we are implementing now. We had an IBP process almost. We are running IBP for almost last seven years. But that was manual. It takes humongous tasks to do scenario planning. We were not agile. We are transforming that entire IBP globally into a digital platform, which can tell us if I have to address to a higher demand, do I run extra shift, do I run extra day, or I outsource it, which is the most economical solution. The platform tells you within a, within a click of a button. If you try to do it manually for a large product like us, okay, uh, it takes almost a week to do that scenario. So this is the digitally enabled system actually is helping us in a great way to become agile to meet that requirement of the customer with regards to cost, quality, and delivery. So, yeah, please, Zerba. No, 
I'd, I'd just like to add a little bit to, to what you talked about in terms of, you know, within manufacturing. Uh, there are two that I want to talk about. One is uh, the importance of being able to use this data for scheduling because then one can improve the throughput of the plant, particularly in a project business plants like what we have, where, uh, for example, the color change would be a bottleneck. So we are able to dovetail and schedule the running of the various machines in a way that we minimize the number of color changes in a day, thereby being able to enhance the throughput of the plant. The other interesting application which came to mind uh, hearing you is for these uh, project kind of businesses, we have complete component libraries which are available in the system, which when uh, at a point of sale, uh, somebody sitting with the customer, they can draw on those and be able to show the customer a product as it would appear when they receive it. Color, size, everything fitted in take a sign off and then that data gets transferred to the shop floor so there is no di uh, disruption, uh, distortion of information and the customer's voice is received right on the shop floor and then that is put into the system such that we are able to use uh, code generation, identification of panels and making sure that the correct component goes back to the correct customer. So this is just something that I thought I'd like to share. Uh, no, that's on this. fantastic. Uh, uh, we have time for one more question. So, I, uh, so starting with you, Shubankar, you said digital technologies are enabling you in many, many ways, and we were talking earlier that what was not available 10 years now is making things possible. How do you choose technology partners? I mean, what are the two or three criteria when people come to you with solutions and say, we can do this, we can't do this, or we can do wonders for you? How do you choose? What is your criteria? Is very, it very, very uh, difficult question? Uh, see, what happens is that the technology has actually evolved, and uh, the partners are mostly equally capable. And let's say choosing between the salt and a extract uh, is equally equally difficult. Which one you want? Oh, so let or me just ask you. Uh, let's let's go to the implementation uh, partners. I mean, are you looking at vendors who understand your domain, your industry, your workflows slightly better, or at. are you looking at only people who come and say, here is my product, buy it? No, no. So we look at three things. One, definitely is the product. Mm -hmm. Second, we do run an assessment which says, has the product been implemented in similar industries within India and globally? Third, what is the presence of the uh, service partner within India, can they support us within India? It may be a great solution, but operating out of Netherlands doesn't help me. Okay. Uh, fourth is the availability of resources in our, because we have 16 sites, okay. Availability of resources which can support us at the different locations. And third, different, last but not the least, definitely is cost is also a factor. But in this equation, how do people who are starting up or startups or smaller companies who may understand it much better fit into your depends, scheme of things? Uh, it depends on the solution you want. For example, if I have to implement a global IBP platform, I will look to a global solution. So maybe it will be O9 or uh, Blue Under or Oracle IBP and all. But we also have very local solutions implemented, let's say, for our transportation management system. We have implemented a very local app, homegrown in Chennai, doing wonders for us. Our fulfillment level for our vehicles, which almost 2,000 vehicles we use every day, those, the utilization levels have gone up from 60% to 85%. So what I hear is that there is an openness to openness. experiment with uh, new Absolutely. technologies and new partners. Absolutely. Absolutely. Harish? Your view on this? No, I think I uh, agree with uh, Shubankar. I think uh, in India, that's the big advantage. In fact, we run a lot of our POCs with startups, particularly on the emerging technologies. So, for example, one of the use cases we are doing right now is to use video analytics to ensure that some of the, uh, you know, chemical tankers which come into our factory, you know, they actually follow the defined quality process. Otherwise, there are a lot of loopholes which can happen and humanly you can't really track maybe, you know, uh, hundreds of tankers moving in and out of factories, right? So, those uh, work really get done very well by the Indian startups. A lot of work happening in the uh, freight area, where, uh, you know, the entire uh, understanding of the Indian ecosystem and working with our local transporters is where a lot of value add kind of comes in. And on the other side, uh, we have those uh, maybe pan company solutions where you will look for 
a larger partner like uh, you know Capgemini or L and T or any of those partners, right? So it's a mixed bag. So we run innovation with startups and uh, maybe a mature solution. You work with a established vendor. That is the way we look so, at it. So you see, both of you see a change in the way manufacturing organizations, so-called traditional manufacturing organizations, are. In, uh, are adopting when it comes to yes. engaging with smaller companies, yeah. with newer partners and newer technologies. Yeah. That, that change is visible. Change There's is only is one so. rider. Uh, challenge for all the startups is that they have to be, everything else is taken for granted, but the only place where they will have to com be competitive is the cybersecurity. No. The big tech, big, large organizations like us, we are ready to venture, we're ready to explore, we're ready to innovate ready to work with you, give opportunity. The only place where we will not be able to compromise is cybersecurity because that ultimately infects our my servers out there. So that's table stake, that's stake. Granted, rest everything can be explored. Zirwan, complexity of Godrej manufacturing plants across so, partners, so, solutions. Um, you know, we, we would actually first ensure that we have some clarity and I, I would say a detailed clarity of what we are looking for before we start engaging with any solution providers. That's number one. Number two is we are open to working with, uh, with startups and with you know, ones that have worked. But we have a very strong filtering system in terms of a corporate digital team. And we have to pass it through that. That's where we take care of the various uh, checks on the cyber security part. So we actually then, so we start first with the application. We have our uh, very clear list which has to be check marked off. We are open to doing co-development. <coughs> and we have some amount of the capability where we are in a position to co-develop with them. And then we run them through the filter of the uh, digital team before we give a final go-ahead to start working. Thank you, Zirvan. Uh, we are just three and a half minutes left into the session. Any questions from anybody? There are quite a few hands. Maybe gentleman here, and then the gentleman there, please. Oh, there's another person there, three. Maybe we'll just start with him and then come to you, sir. Please. Yeah, uh, myself, Pramod. I'm from Dassault System, and I'm very happy to be associated with both Asian uh, Asian Paints as well. <laughs> uh, so my question is, uh, looking at these all the supply chain challenges that we discuss, where it is more difficult, it is locally. I mean, within India or globally, where we find it more difficult managing supply chain, and uh, I mean, what kind of difference locally and globally? So I guess the d level of difficulty is same across, okay. Uh, I would say India is more agile. Globally in the automotive segment, we are into a larger headwind as automotive component manufacturers are graduating into EVs. We have a big challenge globally, especially in Europe and US. So not all automotive, uh, man automotive component manufacturers are looking at partnering beyond X number of years. Uh, India is more agile, okay, but uh, at the same time, so I would say it's a mixed thing. It's more or less a very similar situation. Uh, thank you. Sir, please. Okay. I'm Mahesh Kumar More, leading sustainability at Mercedes-Benz. Thank you for touching the aspects how the uh, supply chain industry is adapting to the challenges because of the pandemic and geopolitics. But I have a question related to the upcoming challenges. Now we are looking forward to alternate materials and uh, localization as a part of sustainability. That would mean that there would be shortage of alternate or recyclable materials, as well as in order to achieve the localization to reduce the carbon footprint, the supply chain or the logistic waste needs to be cut. So how the supply chain industry is looking forward to these challenges? Zirvan, would you like to take? Thank you. No, so I, is your question about how we go about with the localization? How we go forward to, with the localization and the uh, alternate carbon footprint? So, yeah. carbon okay. footprint. so carbon footprint, let me at, uh, uh, address first, because we would obviously look for more and more suppliers for each of our 10 locations, no. you know, closer to. So we try and work within a 20, 30, 40 kilometer radius. Initially, when these are set up, we would send material right across from one location to the other. So cutting that down, that is one part of it. Now, the other part of it, which we are talking about is the material, alternative material. Now, there, there is a very detailed process that has to be done before one really adapts. So one explores the material property-wise, how it can be built, uh, brought into the uh, product solution and obviously the availability of that as well because if you are, you can't run, run into a risk upfront with your eyes open. So 
that is a it's a detailed process by which we then establish that yes this is a workable solution and then we go ahead and and work with that uh, thank you third question there was another gentleman oh, please yeah. ma'am uh, this is meera from uh, reno nissan and my question is like uh, we have seen that the supply chain industry has evolved a lot so uh, throughout your efforts towards the the digitalization what are the challenges you face in the value chain like uh, from your vendors and the other stakeholders and how do you overcome that so Harish, should you I'll, like yeah i'll just maybe start off because um, you know there's one part of it in terms of how much technology has adapted to the industry there is another challenge that whether where the parts the vendor partners are concerned how much their systems have been adapted to technology in the first place so there's a lot of informal when the msmes that's a major challenge because that is a bulk of the you know the supply uh, part of the in terms of sheer numbers they may not be very high in value developing them and getting them into some level of organization where they are in a position where we can then get them to adapt to digitize supply chain is an effort which we have started almost a decade ago so we know that this is a process some fall by the wayside some pick it up faster some are you know slower but that is something that is a major challenge and upskilling them because in in fact i don't think any of us touched upon the fact that upskilling is a major area where even as oems we need to do it and we need to do it with our uh, you know uh, upstream uh, business partners sorry you know so uh, i think absolutely spot on zurwan one thing uh, where we are really grappling with what i talked about this tier 2 three tier 3 three impact of supply chain i think somewhere at least uh, the ask from the industry side for us is to see how we can really use some of the large language models and all of that to really scan the environment and make sense out of it in terms of how a event happening wherever it is happening impacts your supply chain today there is too much of information too much of noise and my team just deals with trying to uh, you know figure out those impacts so there is a lot of potential to bring those visibilities now into the models uh, thank you harish uh, there were a couple of questions there would request to catch hold of these eminent people outside times up uh, thank you very much for a economy which is promising to be 5 trillion going to 10 trillion and perhaps 15 in our own lifetime uh, you will not see uh, uh, economy growing so fast without the manufacturing systems in place without manufacturing scaling supply chain is absolutely integral to it and with these folks adopting new technologies huge opportunities for everybody involved in the room thank you very much i hope you all found it very useful and thank you once again for more content on tech and leadership subscribe to nascom youtube channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update